Before I, I start my little address, I, I would like to thank a couple of guys in the hall tonight who we call the London Lads. Um, this campaign's been going on for over 40 odd years, and yet for the splitting tactic, we haven't seen anything of them, but they've kept the campaign going. There's a couple of them in the hall tonight. I want to publicly thank you for all your support. You've done a magnificent job. And we've done it together tonight. But also, I'd like to apologise in, uh, in case I get a bit angry or, or, or in case I get a bit emotional. Because I've done okay myself, but a few of the lads haven't. And out of the 24 that were arrested, four of them have died. One's in his 90s, Alzheimer's, another fella's 90 oddies. He doesn't know what day it is. The youngest is uh, 68. I'm 77, and we're having a hard job getting anywhere. But let me take you back first of all. I was a scouser living in North Wales. And by trade, I'm a city and guilds plasterer. But I couldn't get any work living up in North Wales in Wrexham. I got a job on a building site as a glorified labourer working with the joiners with the health and safety team. And that was, this, that was it. And then, of course, the building strike come along. But I had been, I must confess, I'd been a steward on various sites in the Merseyside area since the age of 17 or 18 years of age. And so when the strike came along, we obviously joined in, and the, the lads from Wrexham, from North Wales, asked me if I would be the mouthpiece or the delegate, call it what you will, on that particular site. And of course, I, I, I accepted and done it, and done it to the best of my ability. Now, we went on, and we're now known as the Shrewsbury 2, that Desi Warren and myself. Let me tell you now from the outset, I didn't know any of them lads. I didn't know any of the six of, 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 of the other five who ended up in the top with me. But anyway, the strike was called, we went out on strike. We went to, we had a, it, it was very, very successful. It lasted a long time, it, it lasted nearly 13 weeks. And when I used to go around picketing, and I had to go out and picket some of my own family, by the way, who, who were building contractors and that, and you have to go on, you have to bring them off the site, you have to say, come on, and it obviously causes divisions within the family, but that's the job you've chosen to do or you've accepted, you've got to go and do it. So you have to go on the site and say, Dennis, you've got to get the lads off, and that's it. But anyway, the strike was, as I say, was very, very successful, but it's the one and only ever official building site that's ever been. The only one, I want to remember that because it's very, very important. But it was very successful. And as I say, it lasted a long time, 13 weeks or whatever it was. And we went all over the place. And that's when the, 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 they started using the word flying picket really came, came into being. Because on the, on, the, on the 6th of September, we went around all these sites. And we'd living in North Wales in a little village. And I was living in a council house, by the way. Living in a council house with two small boys. And I used to take Clifton, my eldest lad, on my knees, on my shoulders, he'd be about five, and I'd take him around the sites with me. But on this particular day, we were going by coach, because we'd had a call because we could go as far as Oswald Street. So I had to hire a coach of the local, of a, a, a man called Techwin Price, and say, Techwin can hire a coach from eight o'clock in the morning till one or two o'clock in the afternoon, because he does the school run. And he said, yeah, of course you can, of course you can. And that's what we've done, and that is very important, and this will come out later. But anyway, we went on the picket and we went round and we, we went round all these sites and when we got to Osmond Street, which was round about one o'clock where we thought was the last site, we had a distress call from lads to go, if we could go further afield, into Telford. That was a huge McAlpine site and they wouldn't come off. They weren't interested and it was a big, big site with loads and loads of workers. So I had to phone this guy, I had to phone Techman back in Wrexham and say, Techman, do you mind if I have the coach to carry on? I won't be back now till five or six o'clock. And he said, that's fine. Now this is important because he was actually dragged into the court to give evidence to verify this, which he, which he did, by the way. So we went on to this site. We had a great meeting, had a great meeting. Um, obviously, like, when they see all, all these coaches arriving, a lot of the lads got off, you know, they, they fled and whatever, because they knew they were doing wrong. They knew the score. They were scabby. You, you can use these words, scabs, black but they knew. It was the one and only strike, and they knew we would have the better health and safety condition. And we weren't asking for the world. We were asking for £30 for 35 hours. £30 for 35 hours. And in our industry, the health and safety was most important because someone died every day. The fatality rate in the building industry in, 19, in the 1970s, and it's not much better today, by the way, was equal to that of the mining industry and the farming industry put together. 
And if you started work at 8 o'clock in the morning and you got soaking wet, you either went home and lost your pay, or you worked all day and then wet clothes, because there was nowhere to dry them. If you wanted to go to the toilet, you either got a cement bag and found a bush or a tree or, or, or whatever, or went home. And if you were lucky enough to find somewhere to go to the toilet, there was nowhere for you to wash your hands. There was no facilities whatsoever. And it wasn't uncommon, there was a lot of Irish lads working on the site, and it wasn't uncommon to see them sleeping in the cement hut because they couldn't afford to go into digs. That was commonplace. And I'll just give you one example. I used to go round on a Monday morning and collect the subs, the, the, the union Jews, because by the end of the week the lads would be skint, because they'd spend most of the time, they were away from home, they'd go to the pub and they'd drink their wages. So I used to go round on a Monday morning and collect the subs. And I had a little hand over them, going round the site, and the, the man in charge of the job was six foot seven. His name was Rick May, he was an Irishman, and he was from Wolverhampton, as half the site were Irish lads from, from that particular area. And I just want to give you an example of mixed mentality. Now, this man is in charge of a roadworks, of a bypass, of bridges. And he said to me one day, Rick, he said, I want you to uh, get me a staff. He said, I'm going to put, he had a big caravan on the side. He wanted to cover, he wanted his children from the wind. And fair enough. So he wanted all sorts of boarding put around it. He said, I want you to make me a staff. I said, what size? He said, one metre, two foot. One metre, two foot, and he's in charge of the road. <laughs> he must have been in charge of Spaghetti Junction, he must have started off as a fucking zebra crossing. <laughs> it was ludicrous. But I'm going down the site collecting the subs, it's a Monday morning, and he's given this gang, got a man called John DeLay, and he's laughing, this is, this is 1972, and he's giving him this, and get this. And I pulled off, and I waited till he finished. Then I went over to John DeLay, and I said, what's the matter with that, what was that for? Oh, he said, Rick, I didn't turn out yesterday. I didn't turn out on the Sunday. He said, I had two months of drink on the Saturday and I didn't turn in Sunday. I said, there's no need for him to talk to you like that. I said, I'll go and have a bit with him. Oh, he said, don't go and talk to him. Don't, don't. Oh, he said, it's not the first time I've done it on him. I said, why, why did you do it the week before or something? He said, no, it was 1957. <laughs> 1957, and he hadn't had a day off. It was now 1972. That's the truth. Anyway, the strike was very successful. We're all back at work. I goes back on the site, as I say, my plaster by trade. Goes on the site and Mick May comes to me and he went, look, we've got a job for you. We want you to go to Portugal in, show, in, in charge of a brand new roadworks. I said, Mick, I can't read a spirit level, never mind a dumpy level. He said, no, we want you to go to, I'm not going. He just wanted me out the way. Anyway, a couple of days later, I'm working there and we were visited on the site by two detectives. He said, uh, Mickey Tomlinson, I said, yeah, that's right. He said, um, now look, he said, um, we've been into your family background. He said, we know the score. He said, you've got a very nice family. He said, you've never been in trouble with the police and all like that. I said, well, what we want you to do, he said, we want you to give evidence because we're going to bring charges against some of the pickets. Now, don't forget, on the day, on the 6th of September, when this may happen, the post have happened, we were accompanied by 80 policemen, a coach load of policemen. No one was arrested, no one was charged, no one had a name and address taken, and no one was cautioned the whole day. So now they want me to be a prosecution witness. I said, I can't be a prosecution witness, I'm in charge. I was in charge of this area. I said, nothing happened unless I give the OK. I told them where to go, what sites to pick it. I used to give the petrol money out so they could go, to, oh, he said, well, we'll have to prosecute you. And they did. So from no charges, on the 6th of September, they then hit us with 271 charges 15 weeks later. 271. 21 against me and 27 against Des Warren. And it ranged from everything, everything except stealing the crown jewels. They let us off with that. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, it was appalling. So I said, well, I've never been in trouble, it's all right. So the lads organised a defence committee, one thing, and they got us some. Uh, the, the unions, away, but by the way, abandoned us. They said, oh, we can't afford to defend you because it will bankrupt the unions. And so that was it. I was in the TNG at the time, Desi and them were in UCAT. So we had to have um, legal aid or whatever you call it. And I remember I had to go to London to see my barrister, a man called Keith McHale. And as I say, I'd never been in chambers. I'd never been in front of a QC or anything like that. 
And I walked in and listened to this. I want to tell you this. I'm not exaggerating. I'm telling you exactly what happened. I knocked on his door and said, come in. I went, I went and he went, so oh, you're uh, Eric Tomlinson. I said, that's right. He said, uh, how are you going to plead in this case? I said, not guilty. He said, you'll probably get two years. That was it. That was it. No. Did you do it or didn't you do it? Did you see anything going wrong? Did you see any trouble? That was it. You'd probably get two years. So, of course, the trial went on. The trial went on and you've never seen anything like it in your life. It's the biggest police presence in any trial I have ever seen in my life. There wasn't tens of policemen outside the court. There wasn't twenties of police out there. There was thousands of police all round the courtroom, shoulder to shoulder, up the steps, in front of the doors, under the, under the thing, there was police dogs, there was cars, there was motorbikes, and outside Shrewsbury Crown Court, there's a statue, and on top of the statue, there's a policeman with the video camera, the video and everything. So I, I, I didn't get there till about 5 to 10, the court was landing at 10 o'clock, and I went up and they were like that in front of the door. And I went to the fellow, he went, oh, you can't go in there. Oh, I said, that would suit me, thanks very much. <laughs> he said, who are you? I said, I'm one of the defendants. Oh, he said, you better get in there. I think, oh. <laughs> so we went in, and as I say, I'd never been in the court. But in the court, they had the six of us. Now, as I say, I didn't know, apart from like seeing Desi on the picket lines and going down different paths, I didn't know the others. Didn't know them, but there was four of them in the top of this one. But be, uh, before the trial started, they got us in a holding cell, and we had six top lawyers, six, six top juniors. We had Keith McHale, we had John Plattsmills, we had David Taylor, Sam, real good fellas. And they were up against one man called Morris Tracy. And they got us in the holding cell and two of them come down, John Plattsmills and David Taylor, Samuels, and they said, now look, we've had a word, the prosecution, if you decide to plead guilty, you're going to get fined 50 quid. The union will pay the £50 and you'll all be home for 12 o'clock noon. And the first four lads took the deal. And they come to me and they said, what about you? I said, no, you're not on. I'm not taking the deal. I've done nothing wrong. Never been in trouble with the police in my life. You're not on. And Jesse Warren said, and that goes for me too. We're not pleading guilty. And give the other four their due. They said, well, if you're not pleading guilty, so are we. So we went in the box, united. <coughs> Now, from no charges to 271, the trial lasted for 55 days. In today's money, it cost between 12 and 15 million pounds to get these guys and put them in, because they went after us. We were the whipping boys for the miners, because the miners were geared up to have their go. We were the whipping boys. And for not taking any statements on the day, not having any witnesses, they then had 200 and odd witnesses to give us evidence against us. And we found out later, do you know where they got them from? They put 25 detectives in a hotel on the, on the North Wales coast and they scoured the area and took 900 statements, mainly from fellows who scabbed it and worked during the strike. So they had 900 statements and they whittled it down to about 200. Then they discovered that some of the statements weren't strong enough. So they got them back. They showed them my photograph. They said, that's Tomlinson. So you, when you make this new statement out, you can put his name on it. That's Desi Warren. When you make this statement out, you can put his name on it. And they made all them new statements and destroyed the old ones. So that's, that, that was the setup, that was the thing. And it went, it went going. Twice a it lasted for 55 days. We didn't, I didn't know whether we were coming or going. I've never been in that. And yes, my Lord, no, no. Now the judge, his name was Maze. Maze, it should have been Amaze because he didn't have a clue. <laughs> he wasn't even a QC. He, he had been an ecclesiastical barrister and they elevated him to take this criminal case. And he kept getting pulled up by John Platts Mills or David Turner Samuels or David Altas. They'd say, no, you can't do that. And he'd say, oh. Now, he didn't like me. He didn't like me, but he hated Desi Warren. He hated Desi Warren. So as I say, after 55 days, the jury went out and they couldn't reach a verdict. 
So the judge said, well, I'll tell you what. He said, you go to a hotel for the night. He said, and carry on discussing the case, which is out of order. You can't do that. Only supposed to discuss it in the jury room. And he said to us, you lot, you're going back to jail. So we went to jail. They'd already been fingerprinted and photographed. And the next morning, we went into court. The jury came back. And after 10 minutes, they said, look, last night we were stuck 8-4. It was 8-4 majority. This morning, two of them have changed their mind. It's a 10-2 verdict. The judge said, I'll accept it. I'll accept it. So two of them had changed their mind within 10 minutes. So there was a um, suspended, suspended, suspended. Then it comes to Mackie Jones, who was here on my left. Now, Mackie Jones was the treasurer. He wasn't at the meeting where the conspiracy, because they used the word conspiracy on the charges. He wasn't there when the conspiracy is alleged to have taken place because he was the treasurer. He'd come, give all the pets and money out, he'd gone. But he said, oh, the judge said, that doesn't matter whether he was there or not, it doesn't matter if he knows about it or not, he was involved. He got nine months. And he come to me, and he said, I said, well, hang on, before you said, I want to make a statement, I want to, so I had a statement, and I read the statement out, and I said, you know, it's that the jury have been used in this shillard the same as myself and my colleagues. I said, we have done nothing of what we've been accused of. I said, and one day it might be a crime to be a member of a trade union. And he went, fume, fume. Anyway, I got two years on each of the three charges. Then he comes to Desi Warren, and Desi said, and I want to make a speech. So he was absolutely livid. He took his wig off, he threw it on the thing, he turned his chair round. He was fuming. Desi Warren got three years. With that, the foreman of the jury and another one jumped up and started fighting with the other jury, punching, digging. How do I know that? Not because I've seen it, because his son's here. His son's there on the front row. He said his dad never had a decent night's sleep for the rest of his life. They were changed their mind because he said, well, what happened? He said, well, the court usher come into the jury room and said, look, what's all the fuss about? If they get found guilty, they're only getting fined 50 quid and the union's going to pay the fine. Exactly what we'd been told 55 days before. So anyway, we, we, we went into it, we done this court. So me and Desi had a little, little pact. We said, look, we're not going to solve it. We won't, we, we'll do it the hard way. And Mackie, we said to Mackie, because he had claustrophobia, he was in a terrible mess. Terrible mess, his, his wife was, am I off, run over? Yeah, right. Anyway, anyway, let me just, let, let me condense it. So we went on hunger strike. We went on hunger strike for 31 days. They'd moved us down by then into, a, into the hospital wing. And uh, 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 we, got a, we got a telegram off the Labour Party saying, come off, come off, come off the hunger strike. And I said, no, I'm not good. They said, well, your mate's been eating for a couple of days. I said, no, he hasn't. <laughs> no, he hasn't. And he went up to him and said, I don't know what you're doing on, on this song. It's like Tom has been eating neck and shit for a fortnight. You know? <laughs> Tom is stupid. So he said, well, what are you going to do? I said, well, I'm not coming off until I've had a word with him. So he said, well, I'll tell you what, what, what do you want to do? I said, well, tomorrow. I said, well, I'll meet him in the prison yard, and then we'll discuss whether we're going to come off or whether we're going to stay on it. So Desi was a bit silly, you know, but I used to love to make him laugh. I used to love to make him laugh. So the next day, because we weren't wearing clothes, obviously, so, so I can't go in the prison yard, I was freezing. So I got this, my hair, you think my hair's long now, it was down my back, my beard was like that. So I got this old, the blankets off the bed, and I ripped the hole in the middle and put it on like a poncho. And I walked out, and Jesse was already there. And Jesse looked at me, and I'll never forget it as long as I live. And he went, Fucking hell, it's Ben Gunn out to Treasure Island. <laughs> and he, he laughed, and I was made up, it was worth it, all the pain and everything like that. But they started giving him the liquid kosh. They started giving him the liquid kosh. Now, I've got loads of papers here which I'm going to leave. I'm going to put them down there. I particularly want the London lads to have a look at some of these. There's me and Jesse Warren. There's me and Jesse Warren. On trial. There we go. That's us. There we go. Desi was taking the liquid kosh. I wouldn't take it. Desi was taking it. There's Desi Warren after he come out. Strapped into a wheelchair. He never worked again. He was a steel fixer with shoulders on him like Garth. 
and he come out like that. And if I get a little bit emotional here, I, I, I do apologise, but it gets me so angry now, I would just wish I could turn the clock back. When I come out, they threw me out of prison. I didn't get parole. Test in the papers, I got parole. Take no notice. Take no notice. I was in, I was in Leicester prison, and the governor was an expert player. And he came to me, and he gave me the racket trout of Philanthe. He's a wonderful man. And he came to me one day, because I was, I was in what you call a segregation unit, which is solitary confinement within solitary confinement. Not wearing clothes. He said, Rick, you've got a visit tomorrow. And he was a lovely man. I said, look, you know I don't get visits. Can't have visits because you don't wear clothes. He said, no, this is important. This is important. So I put a pair of shorts on the next day and I went up to his office. And there was a fellow called Billy Jones, a joiner. Alan Abrams was a joiner. And an MP from the Midlands called Tom Littrick. And he went, now look, we want you to go home. Now this is in the, in the governor's office. We want you to go home. I said, you want me to go home? I said, I didn't want to be here in the first place. <laughs> he said, no, but you've got to go home. I said, well, I'm not going. He said, no, you've got to. I said, I'm not going. I've seen my wife, she knows the score. I'm going to do me two full years. And they said, well, look, if you do your two full years, you know Desi, he's got an extra year, and he'll do the, his, his three years. He'll do the full three, and we don't think he'll make it. I said, how do you mean? He said, well, he's not well. So I went, I had to agree, I felt so I, but I had to write to him, say, Desi, look, I, I, I've got to go home, I'm missing the kids, I'm doing something other. And I got a letter back, it was terrible. I'd rather he stabbed me. The letter said, you cowardly bastard. You cowardly bastard, we made a pact that we'd do, and I couldn't tell him. And when I went out, I found out what was going on in his home life. I couldn't go and visit him. And I'd never seen him for years. And I don't know what he thought. The only thing I could do was, while he was still in prison, I went to the, to the, uh, the conference in Blackpool, the Trade Union Congress, and got thrown out because on the six o'clock news, because I was screaming for the balcony, let me come down and speak, let me come down and speak, and the Electricians Union blocked it, and in the end he sent the bouncers and he threw me out the gallery. But then one day I went home, a, a little note on the door, Desi would like to see you. Okay. Desi would like to see you. And it was an address, so I went to this address, and it was in Chester, and I knocked on the door, and a woman's voice shouted, come in. And I walked in, and I walked into the living room. And, and he was lying on a mattress on the floor. And there was a rope from the floor to the ceiling. And he pulled himself up. He put his arms around me, and he kissed me. <clears throat> he kissed me. And he said, do you know how long it is since I've seen you? At all, does he? And he knew to the day. And he was so ill and so old. And he died not long after, you know. And he died from, there was two versions. One was drug-induced Parkinson's and the other was chemically-induced Parkinson's. But they killed him. They killed him. Wouldn't let him wear his own shoes. Took his glasses off him. He treated him dreadful. I had a different sense of humour and got through it a little bit different. So when people say to me, why are you still having a go after 40 years? You're an old man, Rick, you're 77 now. You've got a few quid. You can have a nice holiday. You can do I said, no, I owe it to him. I owe it to him. And I owe it to the other lads. And since we've been doing this campaign, what we found out is one of the six was a police informer. John Carpenter was a police informer. Not only informing on us, he wasn't even a joiner. He wasn't in the building game. He was a caterer. He was from the catering game. He had a list of convictions that long. And yet he got a suspended sentence. It was awful. And all I know this is that we've got documents now. But I'm going to leave all these here. I want you to see them. Because you know that they say um, they won't release the papers now. It's 44 years. They won't release them because the papers they will tell you that they've shredded them. They shredded them in November 2012. And I've recently wrote to Chris Grayling, and he won't think. Kenneth Clark has said that what papers do remain will not be will not be reviewed, not shown. They won't be reviewed till 2021, when we'll probably all be dead. So as I say, Desi Warren was adopted as a political prisoner while he was in. There's the letter confirming it. After three months, he was deselected because there was interference from two high-ranking members 
of the Labour Party, Alex Lyon and David Reynolds. And let me just say this before I finish. In the court case, Desi Warren said, and another thing he said, our telephones are tapped. And the judge said, we don't tap telephones in this country, it's not allowed. Desi said, well, I'm telling you, my telephone's tapped. And the judge took it. He said, we don't tap telephones in this country. Desi said, well, I'm telling you, mine's tapped. And the judge said, how do you know? Desi said, because I haven't paid the bill for three fucking years. <laughs> Listen, this is just a little snippet of what went on. But I owe it to Desi Warren. And once again, I want to thank them London lads. They've kept papers for us. They've got a banner there that they use everywhere they go. The fight will go on, ladies and gentlemen. I loved Desi Warren. I loved what he stood for. And I won't let him down. God bless you. Thank you very much.